Ladies and gentlemen, let's go. I can't believe that we're on episode 16 of Scouts, and it's just the Eastern and Western Conference Finals. Yeah. Yeah. Literally the just the beginning of the Eastern and Western Conference Finals. Yep. Uh, whole- it's been an amazing playoffs. Yeah. All 100%. It's been amazing. Loved every second of it. Kick it off for us, Conrad, because my internet's a little glitchy right now, and I'm going to move somewhere closer to the modem. I'm going to sit on the router, as they say. You guys awesome. are getting a little preview of my house behind me. There we go. Apologies, right. apologies, but, you know, it's kind of like a vlog. Yeah, it's perfect. So, today, obviously, we'll be going over the conferences, right? We got Suns versus Clippers. Suns are now up 2-0. And also, the Atlanta Hawks, the fourth seed, just took game one over the Milwaukee Bucks, 116-113. to Fantastic first game. Trey Young dropping 48-11, and along with seven rebounds, which for a guy his size is pretty incredible. Um, my Indiana Pacers just hired a new head coach. We'll talk about that. And then there will be a little bit of a debate that I saw uh, on Instagram, and I want to ask Andrew get his thoughts on it, and we'll maybe we'll be battling back and forth on this. Who knows? But to start off, let's talk. Let's talk about Suns versus Clippers because I think that there's a lot to dissect here, um, just with all the news that that we have coming out. Because first of all, Chris Paul is coming back, coming back for Game Three. He's officially back. He deserves it. Back, and because I think Kawhi Leonard will not play for the rest of this series, I think he's got a torn ACL, and we just aren't. We don't know about it. I think that the that the Suns sweep the Clippers. I think this is it. Chris Paul back. I think they lose the next two games, and I think that they can I won. talk? Can I talk to you about something? And this is a right narrative on. that hasn't been discussed. The Suns are on a nine-game winning streak. They're on fire. They are on fire right now. It's crazy. So let me give you guys context. And this isn't a regular winning streak. So they beat LeBron James, one of the greatest players of all time. They were down two-one, and they came back to win that series four-two. Then they swept the MVP, Nikola Jokic, and the Denver Nuggets team. And now they're 2-0 on the Clippers. A nine-game winning streak. Last year in the bubble, they were 8-0. This Suns team, I've never seen anything like it. You know, if you you just flick the switch, Chris Paul and everything changed. Yep. Oh, well, they they made some other additions. They're a young team, so they obviously got a little bit more knowledge. But, I mean, Chris Paul was a huge reason why they're so successful right now, I mean, in my opinion. Um, just as far as growth during the regular season, and then obviously just as far as running the offense goes in general, right? Um, but, yeah, I think this is it. I think this is it for the Clippers. I hate to say it. They've been playing every single game, right? Two game sevens back-to-back in both series. They just lost their best player on the entire team. I love Paul George with all my heart, but I don't think he's going to be able to get it done against a team that's this good um, on this kind of streak with the amount of rest that they had coming into it. And now they're actually bringing in their like second best player, third best, maybe depending on who you ask, or maybe the best depending on who you ask, right? Like, I just don't see it happening. I think that this the Suns team is sweeping the Clippers now that Chris Paul is coming back, and because I think Kawhi will not be returning for the rest of the series. I think this is it. Is it a down year in terms of like like would this Suns team match up versus the sixteen seventeen Warriors team? They put up a solid fight, but I mean that that those, those teams, they, that was like a dynasty. That's a, that's a super team that's just un, unbeatable, right? It would be like face them facing kind of the Brooklyn Nets this year. Although I still think that the Warriors team obviously was better. It would have been like them facing the healthy Brooklyn Nets roster of this year, and I don't think anybody would have beaten that team. Would they have been like one of the best teams to go up against them? One hundred percent, no doubt. But would they beat them? Not at all. Uh, like there's certain teams that are just too too good to fail. It's one of those years. It's kind of like uh, you know NCAA tournament. You know, you always have parity when it comes to NCAA tournament. You don't know who's going to win the championship. Yep. This year, I mean, coming in, who would have thought Suns, Hawks, Clippers without Kawhi or the Bucks would be the the final four? I know we don't call it the final four. It's uh, it's been a cool playoffs. You know, uh, people are loving it. The games are amazing. Let's let's switch over before we get to the Hawks Bucks. I want to hear about the Instagram poll. Ah. The Instagram question. So I was thinking we could wrap this wrap up with this, but this does have to do with the Hawks uh, Hawks Bucks series. Is Trey Young already a better number one option than Kyrie Irving ever was in his entire career? Your your number one option, your your face of the franchise, your leader, is Trey Young already better than Kyrie ever was? This is fun. I like this. Um, when 
Harden and Kyrie. Uh, when Harden got, came to the Nets, this is what Kyrie said. They played a few games together, but they said, there's not going to be any issue here. James is the point guard. I'm the shooting guard. Kyrie is not a point guard. He has the point guard attributes. We see as handles and all that stuff. But if you look at Kyrie's game, he's a true shooting guard. I agree. Uh, Trey Young is a modern-day point guard. So to me, the comparison isn't fair. Kyrie isn't a number one. Kyrie's a shooting guard. Kyrie's a Kobe. Kyrie's a Tracy McGrady. Ky- Kyrie is a traditional number two guard. This is where I go. I want to hear what Conrad has to say. You might be like, Andrew, you're crazy. What are you talking about? Kyrie's a point guard. That's all right. He's allowed to say that. To me, they're completely different players, different style of game. Uh, one's a true number one point guard, Trey Young. Kyrie is a shooting guard. If you want, you could elaborate on the question if someone had, like, who would I pick to start a team with? Yeah. But curious to hear your thoughts, Sam. I mean, I, I do agree with you, but I don't – I wouldn't – I agree that Kyrie's a number two. But I wouldn't say that that's a big enough reason to say that this is – that he can't be, like, your true number one. Right? I don't think that – I don't think that should count him out of the debate. Because he's still a good – he's still a solid playmaker. And, I mean, in reality, he can still give you whatever 30 points a game – or 40 points, not 40 points a game, but, you know, 40 points in a night, 50 points in a night if you really need mm-hmm. it to. So, I mean, is it is it fair to compare Is it fair to compare their statistics overall and see Trey Young dropping 25 and 9 versus Kyrie maybe dropping 25 and 6 and say that's the reason why? Like, that's the reason why he's a better number one? I would say no. But overall, if you just take a look at Kyrie's history, he's just never really been able to accomplish, like – as a number one, what Trey Young, in my opinion, already has just getting to the Eastern Conference Finals, right? Um, now, it's a tough question. I mean, that's kind of why I asked it because I just wanted to hear what you had to say. I really don't know how to answer this. I would say, yes, Trey Young definitely, like, what he's accomplished so far is better. But then again, has Kyrie been in a situation where maybe he was best suited as a number one or maybe like on those Boston Celtics teams because he is a score first player. And then he also had Jason Tatum, Gordon Hayward, Al Horford, Jalen Brown, who are all who are none of them are playmakers. No one to run the offense. Is it a fair comparison? I would probably say yes, because a guy like Kawhi Leonard has been on, you know, the Clippers roster right now as a number one and was last year's number one. And they're a very similar team in that aspect, in my opinion. And he is or has been able to accomplish more um, given the circumstances as a number one in that situation. So super difficult question to ask. I just wanted to see what what your thoughts were on that. Um, Go ahead if you have anything else. But if not, we can move on to the Hawks and Bucks series. It's an interesting question. It is not like it's one of those questions that keeps going as you think more about it, right? Yep. And yep. I'm like, well, Kyrie's a good passer. He's a good playmaker. They have similar styles. I think the big difference is Kyrie is a score first guard, where yep. Trey Young is someone who runs the offense. He he's not he's not score first or pass first. He's just kind of whatever's needed in the moment. He's a quarterback, correct? Where Kyrie is just going to give you the same stuff every day. He's going to bring his handles. He's going to buckets. He's going to finish at the rim. He, he's score, 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 score. You know, in his mind, it's score, score, score. Um, he still gets his assists. He has the ball in his hands a lot. He's an incredibly talented player. I, I liked watching him on this Nets team. Yeah, uh, I love To him. me, it's a mentality difference. It's a quarterback versus a score. How do you approach the game? Exactly. Yep, I agree. Um, and we definitely did see Trey Young's prowess as a quarterback uh, coming into play last night against the Milwaukee Bucks. Like I said, 116-113, the Bucks did lead this game for a solid, not majority, well, a majority of the game, but it wasn't like quite a crazy lead that you would be shocked that the Hawks did come back to win this one. Um, I think that the, that the Bucks' defense was just kind of crumbling towards the end, but most importantly... I, it's my one of my biggest complaints with this team. Chris Middleton cannot be your number two. He just can't. He's too inconsistent. Um, and I'm not saying that that's going to prevent them from winning a championship in this situation because at this point, the Bucks are probably the best team potentially besides the Suns currently constructed in the playoffs, right? So, like, they should have a relatively easy rest of the way to go. Um, but that's, that's just one of their biggest issues that they got to get over besides coaching is – 
besides Giannis or even including Giannis, like who's who's your guy that you look at and you say, you give me 30 points every game. You give me 25 points every game. They don't really have a guy like that. And that's kind of an issue, right? They do have a good enough supporting cast where you can kind of, as an NBA fan, it, it kind of goes unnoticed. But in specific moments like this, especially during the postseason, you sit back and you watch the games and you're like, he's not hitting his shots and they really need him to. Um, and that, that was Chris Middleton. That was Chris Middleton last night. And it could be an issue going forward. So I, I thought the Bucks were the better team in, in the game yesterday. I, I thought the defining moment was uh, they were up by four points. There's two minutes left. And the Hawks had three uh, attempts at a three point. They got the offensive rebound twice. And John Collins hit the three from the corner. Remember that? Yes. Two, yes. I two minutes so. left. They're up by four. And that was the defining moment. A team that's so much bigger. You have. You have Giannis, you have Brooke Lopez. You're just – guys, That you have to get that rebound. Yep, Giannis. Two offensive – you have two offensive rebounds, and instead of a four-point game, the Bucks have the ball, two minutes left, opportunity to go up six, win that game at home. In reality it, – It was just – It's one. a one-point game. Mm-hmm. So that, to me, was really the defining moment in that game. By defining moment, do you just mean like the moment where the tide turned or the moment that just kind of sh- – that showcased – everything that happened in the game. I would say the first one personally, because I feel like that's where the momentum shifted. But I think because I think personally for the, for the most part, and you said this earlier, the Bucks were the better team for pretty much the entire game. They played well until it came towards the end of the game. And then they just kind of fell apart, especially on the defensive end. And that was their ultimate downfall. So maybe that's a good represent, representation of the fourth quarter, but I wouldn't see the entire game. However, I would also say that's where the momentum did shift, and that's when the Hawks kind of got into the game and won. We've seen some blowouts, but we've we've, we've alluded to, we've talked about it a little bit on the in the beginning of this episode. The games have been so much closer in this postseason. Every game's been coming down to the fourth quarter, and a part of that is what we said. You know, the the, the talent level has evened out. So when that happens, you're going to have close games. And when you have close games, your margin for error is a lot smaller. There's a there's a little bit of closing out games, not in like we're going to outscore you. I'm going to out-rebound you. I'm going to get that important rebound. I'm going to play smart. And they gave up those two offensive rebounds. John Collins hit the three. It was a one-point game. And then from there, it was pretty – they didn't run good offense from there. I don't think they even scored a bucket until after the Hawks took the lead. So – no, it was closing out the game. I do know that they didn't run the offense very well. Continue. It, we, it's closing out the game, and I think it's going to swing both ways, and I think it might happen in both series too because these are very inexperienced teams. Yeah. None of these teams have been this far, and you're going to see some inexperience, some nerves, some not – closing out a game is a little bit different than winning a game in a regular season. Playoff games are going to be a lot closer. So it, it was an interesting moment. I think the series is far from over. I'm excited to watch it play out. I, I 100% agree. I still think that the Bucks are going to win this entire series. I think that I, – I mean, I'm not saying that the Hawks don't stand a chance because, I mean, I did bring up two episodes ago that they have a chance to win the finals, and this was before uh, they'd even beaten the 76ers. They have a legitimate shot at winning the finals right now, so I'm not going to say that they can't win, but I'm still going to pick the Bucks right now. I do 100% agree with that. But something I do want to mention, I'm going back to the um, to the Sun series. This just has to do – you were talking about how – in the, in the fourth quarter, you know, closing out games, we've seen a lot of close games, and we did see a very close game, uh, Suns versus Clippers game two, right? Last minute, you know, tip dunk, quote-unquote, by DeAndre Ayton. And I want to say something. He did a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Monty Williams did a great job with a uh, fantastic play. DeAndre Ayton obviously did a great job getting open. But I do think that Jay Crowder deserves the most credit in that situation, and I don't think people are really – either giving him his credit or paying enough attention to him. Because here's the thing. When you only have like half a second left to get a shot off, you can't grab the ball on a tip dunk and throw it down. Because as soon as the ball touches your hands, the, the clock starts. And if you don't get it out of your hands fast enough, then the buzzer goes off and you lose the game. Right? So that means that Jay Crowder had to place it right above the basket. So that way DeAndre Ayton could just touch it and it goes in, which is exactly what happened. Because if he grabbed it and threw it, he would not be able to get off in time. That ball placement by Jay Crowder was literally the most perfect alley-oop placement, the most perfect lob that I've ever seen for any sort of last-second play. 
phenomenal job by him. And I just wanted to say that, just give the guy credit because that was a fantastic pass. When did, when did we talk about Jay Crowder? Like everywhere he goes, he wins. It was like a few episodes ago, right? Yeah, it was a few episodes ago, but yeah. I mean, Cause, Cause he was on the Celtics team. He was a winner there. Cavs. Heat, heat. Cavs and heat. And then now Suns. Yeah, exactly. I, and I mean, look, and granted, I mean, he's not, he's not the guy that's obviously making these teams, you know, contenders, but when you have role, it, it, it emphasizes the, the importance of role players and guys that know, Hey, I'm not going out there and doing everything. I'm going to play really good defense and shoot threes, or I'm going to run the offense off the bench. Or I'm going to be I remember when we talked about it. It was when you said uh, Jeff Green's a better option at a million dollars a year. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Jeff Green is like the perfect exa- example. Exactly. How much, I'm going to look up how much Jay Crowder makes a year. I think Jay Crowder makes like $13 million, something along those Ooh. lines. Is he 13 times better than uh, Jeff Green? No, but um, maybe he's 13 years younger because Jeff Green has got uh, <laughs> got some age on him. $7.8 million. Seven point okay, maybe what maybe was it was it a two year thirteen million dollar deal? That sounds like right or Green not thirteen, seven. but like something million dollar deal. Jeff Green fifteen million, but that's in two thousand sixteen. Yeah, these oh, numbers yeah. are inaccurate. Yeah, Jeff Green made made a lot of money when he first signed, but I mean now he signs for pennies on the dollar for his production. Regardless, that's enough talk about what's currently going on in NBA games. Let's talk about my what what. What about real real quick? What about uh, PJ Tucker? What is this graphic? So PJ Tucker, there's four, there's three Houston players in um, the Western and Eastern Conference Finals, and James Harden is not one of them. Oh yeah, I saw that. I saw that. I think it was Clint Capella, PJ Tucker, and somebody else. I don't remember who it was. Who was it? I saw that graphic though. It was it was it was the. I'm going to guess it's just some guy on the end of the bench that we literally have no idea who it is. P.J. Clinton's somebody else. I don't remember who, though. Damn it. Well, it'll come to us. It'll come to us. Yeah, it'll come to us at some point, maybe. Or you could just look it up right now. What do you... Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. What uh, What do you make of the Indiana Pacers uh, yeah. head coach signing? I want to talk about this a lot. I got some issues with my own team. Okay. So I'm going on mute. I'm going on mute. This is all yours. This is your segment. Conrad Uncaged Special Edition. Yeah, sure. So for those of you that don't know, the Indiana Pacers just signed, or they, they got rid of, they fired uh, Nate Bjorken. I still don't know if that's how you pronounce his name correctly, but I'm just going to assume it is. Nate Bjorken, uh, right after like we were eliminated from the postseason, right? He was having a lot of trouble with the players. Uh, lots of arguments going on. Didn't like the way that he was running the offense or the, de- the defense in general. Just a terrible coach. Nobody liked him whatsoever. I think TJ Warren put something out like right after he was fired, talking about like, you know, like praise the Lord or something like that. Just super happy that he was finally gone. And he's not even playing. So imagine how it was for the guys that were actually out there on the court, right? Um, and so we just re signed a new coach who happened to be fired from the Dallas Mavericks or leave the Dallas Mavericks. Rick Carlisle. We signed him on a four-year deal, which is one of my first things that I want to talk about. Why do we sign coaches to four-year deals when we don't even know if they fit well with the team? Because he could easily just get fired next season. If you want, if you hire someone new, hire him for a year, hire him for two years. Of course, I understand that then the issue is that then they could be competing with other teams who are going to offer them longer deals, stuff like that, right? Because then obviously they want financial security as a head coach. So they're going to take the four-year deal over the two-year deal. But still, if I'm if I'm a franchise, I'm not willing to pay the extra amount of money that it takes to fire a guy and then still have to pay him the rest of his deal even when he's not on the team. It sucks. Um, so we signed him to do a four-year deal for those of you that don't know, and I hate the fit that he brings. First of all, he slows down the offense way too much, way too much. And in my opinion, you need to be running a fast-paced offense to win uh, to win games in the NBA, especially if you don't have good floor spacing which is something that we we struggle with as a team. Nobody on our team shoots threes really well. Malcolm Brogdon's all right. Miles Turner's one of the better three-point shooting big men. And then we have a couple of role players that space the floor pretty well. But our main scoring options, TJ Warren, DeMontis Sabonis, um, I guess Karis LeVert's all right, but he definitely has some room to improve from three. Nobody there like is, is exceptional at shooting the three ball. right? So we need to be running a more fast-paced offense, in my opinion, um, in order to see some real success in the league. Right, and which we might have the potential to do, um, but not only that. That's not my only issue with the team right now. It's just what are we doing? <laughs> what, like, what, what's going on? Because um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm personally just, just a bit afraid that because Karis LeVert is just now coming back, right? Well, not just now coming back, but he just joined the team this season. TJ Warren is coming back. He didn't play like at all last year. And Miles Turner is just now coming back from an injury. You're telling me that we're basically adding three new guys into the system along with changing the system entirely. I think it's going to be a mess for us in the beginning of the year. And I think that's going to just hold us back completely next season. And in my opinion, because these guys are all pretty much in their primes and our ceiling is the semifinals, I think we need to just blow it up and rebuild this team personally. I'm just, I'm really upset with my own team uh, a lot, especially because of this signing. It's a win now signing. And, um, you know, things things just suck. I would like to get Kenny Atkinson on the roster if I can. But You love can't. that guy. He needs I, to get a job, right? What would you say? He needs he should he should get a job based on his uh, track record. He really does. I don't understand why he doesn't have one. We talked about him last episode, but um, that that can be that can be saved for another day if we really. Have what to. um, Ime Udoka? They're, I don't know if I pronounced that right. The, the guy the oh. Celtics just hired. I know yeah. nothing about this guy. Do you I, know anything? Do you want to say? Do you want to save it for Monday's episode? I, I I will just mention this briefly. I've heard some good things about overall their overall the Brooklyn Nets assistant coaching staff because they they had some other guy that was actually pretty good. I don't know if he got signed or if there's still rumors flying out about him. But they had some other guy that people were thinking about signing. So overall, you know maybe working under Steve Nash wasn't too bad because Nash has one of the better basketball minds that obviously just translate to translates to being a solid coach at least on the offensive end. So I mean overall, I'm not too upset about the move i don't really have any major thoughts or concerns because we haven't seen him as a head coach really that much before um so it'll just be interesting to see how how things play out but overall that's all i've really got for this episode because i also know that my phone's gonna die relatively soon so we appreciate you guys this is episode 16 of scouts we got game three clippers suns tonight 9 p.m eastern game two hawks bucks tomorrow night we love you guys we'll be back with you guys on monday